Stated Clearly presents The Invention That Let Us See Viruses and Beyond. All throughout history, diseases have been mysterious and terrifying. Unable to see the bacteria and viruses that cause many of our illnesses, we created myths to explain our suffering. Some believed that diseases were caused by demons, witches, or were curses sent down to punish humankind. With the invention of the first microscopes, the fog of confusion began to clear. A microscope is any tool that allows us to see details in objects that would otherwise be too small to see with our eyes alone. It's hard to say who invented the first microscope because people have probably been playing around with magnifying lenses ever since clear glass was invented, but it could be argued that the first person to really promote the use of microscopes as serious tools of science was artist and researcher Robert Hooke. In 1665, he published a book called Micrographia. It was filled with beautiful drawings he made while gazing through his microscope. In the book, he reported, apparently for the first time, that razor blades aren't really that sharp if you look at them close up, that insects have strange compound eyes, and that plants appear to be made of tiny structures that he called cells. Several years later, a fabric merchant named Antony van Leeuwenhoek started designing his own microscopes so he could better examine the quality of fabrics he was buying. Curiosity led him to examine many subjects aside from fabric, and he eventually discovered microorganisms. He reported seeing tiny creatures that scientists of his time did not know existed. He found them living in pond water. They lived in beer. They lived in his own saliva and uh, a number of his other bodily secretions. Yo. He called these critters animalcules. It's a lovely mashup of the word animal and molecule. Instead of being grossed out by what he found or embarrassed by the fact that he spent so much alone time with his own bodily fluids, Anthony van Leeuwenhoek was proud of what he found. He wrote about his discoveries in scientific letters to the Royal Society, England's most prestigious scientific organization. They published his letters, and these went on to change our understanding of disease forever. All of the microscopes described so far, and most of the microscopes you find in a high school or college classroom, are what we call light microscopes, or optical microscopes. This is because their lenses bend normal visible light in order to function. Though they can be used to see cells and many microorganisms, including bacteria, they are not powerful enough to see most viruses. To understand how they work and why they have limitations, we first need to know a bit about vision in general. Anything we would call a light source, the sun, a light bulb, a candle, is constantly emitting photons, tiny packets of light. It's often helpful, though it's not technically accurate, to think of a photon as a little squishy ball that travels at the speed of light in a straight line. When it hits something, depending on what it hits, it can either bounce off, pass through, or be absorbed. A burning candle spits out billions of photons per second in all directions, which then bounce off objects until the photons are absorbed. Lining the back of the inside of your eyeball is a photon detection screen made of cells, your retina. When photons bounce off an object, happen to go directly through your pupil and strike your retina, they are absorbed and a message is sent to your brain saying light of this color hit the retina here. Your brain is constantly piecing thousands of these signals together to form a moving picture in your mind. Here's the important takeaway from all of this. Sight works because lots of little projectiles are bounced off of objects in the environment and then absorbed into a detection screen. If you want to build a seeing machine, you can use just about anything as your projectiles. You could even use gummy bears instead of photons if you wanted to. So long as lots of projectiles can be bounced off the object you want to see, and so long as your projectiles can leave a mark on some kind of detection screen. There is more to building a good seeing machine. As you may have noticed, this one can only show the rough outline of a flat object, and in real life it wouldn't even do that nearly as well as it does in this cartoon. But one thing worth understanding now is that if you want a clear picture, each of your projectiles should be smaller than the object that you want to see. Sadly, the wavelength of a photon of visible light is far larger than many things that scientists want to look at. Photons are far larger than atoms, 
larger than most proteins, and even larger than most viruses. To overcome this problem, in the 1930s, Ernst Ruska and Max Knoll created the world's first functioning electron microscope. These microscopes shoot electrons at their subjects instead of photons. Electrons are up to 100,000 times smaller in wavelength than photons of visible light. Here, we see an electron microscope image of pollen grains. These actually could be seen with a light microscope as well, but not in nearly this great of detail. Smaller still, here we see HIV, the virus that causes AIDS. Here we see the Ebola virus. And here we see the new guy in town. Thanks to the invention of the electron microscope, humankind has been brought face to face with viruses, our ancient invisible foe. As wonderful as this advancement was, scientists continued pushing further still. In the 1980s, an entirely new way of seeing was invented when researchers at IBM produced the first scanning probe microscope. There are now many types of scanning probe microscopes, but they all work in essentially the same way. They see by feeling the bumps and valleys along the surface of an object with a tiny metal probe, much like a man who is blind reads braille with his fingertips. Data collected from the probe as it scans is used to generate an extremely high resolution image. Here we see not cells, not viruses, but individual atoms, the elements of matter itself. In 2009, with funding from the National Science Foundation, physical chemist Ara Upkarian, along with his colleagues, founded the Castle Research Center, chemistry at the space-time limit. He chose team members from among the world's greatest microscope innovators, including Dr. Kumar Wickramasinghe, who engineered microscopes for IBM, Dr. Nianhui Ga, who specializes in imaging biological molecules, and Dr. Wilson Ho, known for having built several of his own scanning probe microscopes from scratch. The purpose of the Castle Research Center is to push the limits of what we can see through a microscope. To do this, they have combined the use of visible light with scanning probe microscopes. Now, as I'm sure you recall, photons of light are far too large to see individual atoms and molecules, but Castle researchers found that if photons are aimed at a properly built probe, a silver needle shaped in just the right way, the probe will guide photons to its apex and compress them to dimensions much smaller than their usual size. At the apex, near the sample, photon quanta are absorbed and re-emitted. This allows even individual atoms to be seen. In other words, Castle researchers found a way to shrink light. The various machines they built all work slightly differently and have a variety of jargon-rich names, but in general, they are referred to as chemoscopes. They let us record not just the shapes of molecules, but also the motions of atoms inside them. They let us measure the molecular motions that power chemical reactions. In the field of quantum physics, chemoscopes will aid in the development of quantum computers because they allow us to directly record a molecule's quantum behavior. In the field of biology, chemoscopes are being designed to allow us to directly read an organism's DNA. Once perfected, this will be far better than the tedious, error-prone methods of DNA sequencing that scientists use today. Last but not least, in the field of medicine, Chemoscopes are now allowing us to see viruses so clearly that not only can we tell different species apart, we can tell different strains of the same species apart. This allows us to watch how viruses evolve over time and figure out just when new vaccines might need to be produced. From simple lenses allowing us to see that insects have compound eyes to the light-shrinking chemoscope allowing us to see virus evolution, microscopes have come a long way. Each step clearing the fog of our confusion. I am John Perry, and that is a brief history of the microscope stated clearly. This animation is part of a series sponsored in part by the National Science Foundation and the Castle Research Center. That's chemistry at the space time limit. Along with this video series, Castle and the National Science Foundation have funded the creation of an amazing online video game called Bond Breaker. In the game, you are a proton, and you go on a bunch of little adventures, learning powerful concepts in chemistry and nuclear physics as you go. I've shown you clips of the game before, but a new version was just released, and it is wonderful.
go check it out at testtubegames.com. There is a link down in the video description. Teachers, use this in your classrooms. It's free.